So, uh, dear friends, in this instruction course, which has been going on for many years, we annually try to share with people the updates on retinopathy of prematurity, which is a burning topic in the developing world, especially considering the sheer magnitude of the case uh, of the population that we need to treat and the difficulties we face. So, the faculty remains the same as last time. We have with us a galaxy of stars in our retinopathy of prematurity. Dr. An Anand Vinayakar is to my right, Dr. Mangatram Dogra, Dr. Shubhadra Jalali, and Dr. Parijat. All of them have excellent experience in retinopathy of prematurity, right from screening stage all the way up to the advanced management of, management of advanced disease, such as stage four and five ROP. And we have one speaker missing. I hope she'll be in time to share her experiences with us, Dr. Karubi Lahiri from Mumbai. But before we start our instruction course, we have a keynote expert from Bangladesh, Dr. Tariq Reza Ali. Uh, Dr. Tariq, can you uh, share with us your experiences on anti-VAGF and ROP management, comparison between global trials and our experience? Dr. Tariq. While Tariq is uh, putting his slides, I think it's a great privilege for me as a teacher to have Tariq who has uh, trained uh, with me uh, in El Pisada Institute, uh, I think almost 20 years back or maybe 20, 20 years back. And he's been leading the fight against ROP blindness in Bangladesh. He has trained a large number of people. Uh, he looks silent, uh, but he has a lot of uh, energy and he is also you know, working towards uh, making his country ROP blind and Nusrat, uh, who's here, Nusrat Chaudhary, both of them together have changed the scenario for newborn babies in Bangladesh and it's a proud moment for us to have him speak on the keynote point on a very hot topic which is anti -vagif. So, uh, thank you ma'am and thank you sir. It is really, really a very great opportunity for me to be in front of you. You see, every year we come here to learn and to grow. And I must respect my teachers who are sitting here. I have learned so many things from you. And we are trying, Professor Nuzat is here. We are trying our level best uh, to update this knowledge and to help our patients in our country. Today, my topic is anti vasf in ROP management, comparison between global trials and our experience. You see, we know that ROP is an inter interplay of growth factors, not only vascular endothelial growth factor, there are insulin-like growth factor one and transforming growth factor beta, but we are concerned, more concerned about the anti-vascular endothelial growth factor for our patients. Till now, laser is the gold standard and still I believe that laser is the gold standard for ROP management, but there are some demerits. Laser alone for severe posterior APROP, it is challenging if the pupil is not dilating and there are also field defect, high refractive error, and late onset angle closure glaucoma, and there are other changes like cataract and anterior posterior synechia. This is a patient you see, we did laser around 11 years back, and now the patient is 11 years and minus 11 diopter in both eyes, but vision is six by nine, but, but pale disc, and the retina is so much as sclerosis vessels and others. So uh, what are the advantages and reasons for popularity of anti for ROP? It is brief, easy, less stressful, quick and dramatic effect you can find, and less refractive error and better field you can find with, uh, with uh, injection anti -vasive. And there is no retinal ablation and can be done even at NICU. This is the publication which helped us to go for injection anti in our retina patients that beat ROP, which uh, showed the pathway and it told that intravitreal vivacetum monotherapy as compared with conventional laser therapy in infants with a stress 3 plus retinopathy of prematurity uh, showed a significant benefit for zone 1 but non, not zone 2 disease. But later on, we found that some indications like non dilating people and diseases too posterior with vitreous hemorrhage and babies too sick to touch or relatively sicker babies with inadequate neonatal support to tackle in emergencies, we have to go for injection anti -vasive. This is a hypothesis uh, given by Dr. 
Tapas and Dr. Subhadra that uh, what happens after phase the, after putting the injection in the phase one within one week you can find that the stage of rapid quietening and then up to 11 weeks slow vascular development occurs due to new VSA formation and up to 16 weeks a risk like classical ROP appears this may regress completely or it can go to the rebound stage and it depends on the post menstrual age and unknown factors. This is the uh, publication of Dr. Subhadra and others and they showed that if you put in injection at first and then do the laser, the combined therapy was successful for ROP management but before putting the laser you have to put injection then the results will be better. Now it, it came that, uh, that in 2019, we all know about rainbow study. It was a randomized open uh, level superiority trial. There were 87 neonatal centers in 26 countries. It uh, included all zone one, stage one plus, two plus, three or three plus uh, babies. And zone two, it is stage three plus and also APRP babies, they followed the patients at least for 24 weeks. What they found that they had three arm, 0.2 milligram ranibizumab, 0.1 milligram ranibizumab, and laser. The success rate was 80% in 0.2 milligram, 75% in 0.1 milligram, and 66% one in laser. And the odds ratio was around two uh, with, uh, that is ranibizumab, 0.2 milligram with laser. This is uh, the another slide that you see the retreatment needed in 0.2 milligram, 74 uh, out of 74, 22 babies, and 12 was done injection, 11 was done laser. In 0.1 milligram group, the 22 babies needed, uh, that is retreatment, and 12 was done injection, 10 was done laser, and in laser group, only 14 needed retreatment, 13 was done injection and one was repeat laser. So summary of rainbow study was remnivizumab 0.2 milligram was as effective and safe in the treatment of active ROP as laser therapy and it might be superior and was associated with better short term ocular outcome. After two years, there is another rainbow extension study we showed that it is a five years study, but the two years data they have published in 2021, the primary outcome was the absence of structural ocular abnormality. Secondary outcome was vision related quality of life, development, motor function and health status, and investigator determined ocular and non-ocular serious and other ad adverse events. It showed that the infections and others was much less in Ranibizumab of 0.2 gram and also in 0.1 milligram stages. And CNS disorders, it was also not present in all the three groups. And here, the that is, um, refractive error was only 5% in Tanibijima 0.2 gr milligram group and 88% in, uh, that is 0.1 milligram, and with laser, it was 20% myopic patients. But the children's visual function questionnaire, which was done by the parents, you see there was not, not much less uh, difference between the three groups, though it was not statistically significant, but the 0.2 milligram group showed better result. So in conclusion of rainbow extension study at two years, they told that no effects of ranibizumab have detected on neurodevelopment, growth, blood pressure, or respiratory symptoms, and vision-related quality of life ratings more optimal following ranibizumab 0.2 milligram. No late ocular complications affecting vision seen was also seen in this study. Then uh, another rainbow study that is time course of retinopathy of prematurity, regression and reactivation. And regression with 0.2 milligram was done in four days with plus disease, stage three ROP in eight days and AP ROP in seven days. And you see with laser, it was 16, 16 and 22, which was clinically and statistically significant in between these two groups. And if it is reactivation, that is if the patient needed additional treatment, treatment, it was not very much different in the two, two groups, that is 0.2 milligram and 0.1 milligram. But you see there was much less retreatment reactivation in laser group. So in conclusion, they told that intravitreal 0.2 milligram or 0.1 milligram ranibizumab induced a faster regression of plus disease, the stress 3 ROP and AP ROP, but ranibizumab was associated with fewer additional treatment. 
This is another uh, analysis of 40 articles published in ophthalmology. There are 15 RCTs, 13 citations, 6 was level 2 evidence, and 7 articles on level 3 evidence. They also commented that intravitreal anti-invasive therapy as effective as laser photocoagulation for achieving regression of acute ROP. The practice patterns and outcomes of intravitreal anti-invasive in USA and non-USA countries, there was 23 sites, 16 was from US and 7 was from non-US. They showed that in Bivasejumab, they used 71% cases and all other parameters are very similar like us. And you see a retreatment needed in 36% of the babies. Out of this 36, laser was done in uh, seven, that is around 80% babies, antivisant in 11% and antivisant plus laser in 10% babies. And you see the most importantly, they did in stage three ROP, the injection was given. And you see Bivas EGMAP was 72% cases and there was not so much complication and their endophthalmitis was zero. But you see that the patients, they did the injection in US and non-US babies, the injection was given in the neonatal intensive care unit in 80% of cases. But we are putting injection in, the OP, uh, in our OR. This is another study in uh, that is the Royal College of Ophthalmologists. They told that they evaluated all the articles and they told that you see uh, injection bivacizumab or anibizumab both are superior to laser, but they asked to do the laser in zone two diseases at first. And if it is zone one, you can do injection, you put injection avastin or lucentis, whatever you, you, you prefer. There is another comparison and it also told the incidence of disease relapse was higher in eyes with received renibizumab. This is another article. In care ROP group, they told also that neurodevelopmental and functional ocular outcome one and two years after treatment with renibizumab are reassuring regarding long-term safety. This is an LVPI experience I, 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 to, I took from Dr. Takus Padi that one uh, one, one, 111 babies or eyes, antivisor was done in 31, antivisor plus laser in 54, and antivisor plus laser plus surgery in 10 babies in 18 eyes, and antivisor plus surgery in one baby in two eyes. Now I want to share my experience and our experience, that is me and Professor Nuzhat, what we are doing in our university. This is a uh, presentation we gave in APAO in 2022, uh, 2020, uh, from 20, 2012 to 2019. Out of 63 babies, we followed all the only 12 babies with injection. Otherwise, 51 babies, we did injection plus laser in APROP cases. This is the uh, total in 2021. Out of 364 babies, we did injection in 10, laser in 29, and injection plus laser in 10. And in 2022, out of 869, uh, we did this type of, that is, LIO was less than injection. Injection was increasing. This is one month after injection. This is injection and laser. What I want to tell that probably our trend is going to less injection more, much more in 2022 than 2021. Probably this is uh, not correct, uh, but not correct approach for us. That you see the ladder is going towards the injection right now. So in conclusion, what I want to tell that intravitreal intervasive should be used as the first line treatment for zone one ROP. While laser therapy should be the mainstay of zone 2 ROP owing to the different pathogenic mechanism, in patients with recurrence after initial antivisive injection that given ranivizumab may opt to repeat the injection while the given vivacizumab should consider supplement laser ablative treatment. Thank you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for questions here. Uh, thank Dr. Tariq for his excellent lecture and his presentation about anti-VGF roles. I think a lot more discussion will be there on anti-VGF when uh, Dr. Panjaj is going to make his presentation. So now for the actual instruction course, before we start the first talk, let me introduce you the uh, speakers. Dr. Anand Vinayakar is well known to this community. And I understand that most of you are probably very much actively involved in our OP care and you must have read or heard lectures from Dr. Anand Vinayakar many times. He is a senior consultant at Narayan Netralia, 
and has tremendous amount of experience in ROP. Perhaps that's the only work he does. At least 90% of the work he does. And he has contributed a lot on the tele-ophthalmology in the management of ROP and popularized the role of red cam photography by, photo by technicians, which are read by ophthalmologists, thus saving a lot of babies from unwanted blindness. Dr. Anand for you. Thank you, sir. So I'm going to be talking about the current guidelines in the Indian context. Slides. Uh, ah, okay. Um, these are the heads that we're going to cover, but uh, let's go directly into it. So the Indian problem is like probably the largest in the world. We have the highest number of preterm babies in any country, more than twice that of China. That's about 35 lakh babies. Now, if you extrapolate that to the number of uh, specialists that we have, the IROP Society conducted a survey sometime, and we have about less than 200 members, out of which less than 100 are comfortable doing the laser therapy. So yes, there is a big uh, demand supply gap, and that's uh, Government of India uh, data extrapolated that every two hours somewhere, three babies in India are going to require treatment. Why do we have such a big problem? This has been discussed in an editorial. High levels of prematurity, better survival, not so much awareness, oxygen blenders absent, and even among the pediatric community, there is a lot of gap. Now, uh, that's therefore the need to have a national screening guidelines. It started off in 2010 now, about 13 years back. There was some confusion in this about babies between 1750 and 2000 grams. And that problem was set right uh, in the operational guidelines by RBSK in 2017, 2018. And then from there, it was culled out the uh, operational guidelines for ROP itself. So the picture on your left is the RBSK for universal screening with ROP as a chapter and then the operational guidelines on the right. And uh, this is what I'm going to uh, deliberate now. And uh, then this has been tested in the community to see how it can work. This is a great uh, take home point to teach our pediatrician friends, the one, two, three, four rule, which is the first screening should be done for babies born less than two kg. So that's the two and less than 34 weeks. So it's rather simple now that 1750 and 2000 has gone away. So which infants need to be screened are important. But since gestational age is a little difficult to assess sometimes in our rural babies, Birth weight is a very important parameter. So if you know the gestational age, then it's 34. Otherwise, any baby born less than two kgs. It doesn't matter if it's an IUGR baby, less than two kgs. Uh, from a government point of view, from a guideline point of view, easy to manage. Before discharge or once before 30 days of life. So that's the slogan, Tis Din Roshni K. So don't delay the first screening for 30 days, before the 30 days of life. Why before discharge? Because on the average, the NICU stay is about seven to 12 days. Uh, and therefore expecting the mother to come back between week three and week four, the follow-up can be lost. Uh, we showed that in this study, two government hospitals, the follow-up was 12 times more if we screened once before discharge. So it's okay if the baby is few days old, do the first screening, the subsequent follow-up can be done at the right time, which means three to four weeks later. Now, this is the clinical and the legal caveat, 30 days. Don't wait for the baby to become systemically all right. Uh, as Dr. Dogra's group has shown, you can treat these babies uh, through a scratched incubator wall. So when you can treat these babies, why can't you screen them? So convince your neonatologist that this is the sickest babies who have the worst ROP and don't delay the screening. Indirect ophthalmoscopy, I would say, dare to say, used to be the gold standard. Nowadays with imaging, maybe that's changing. But for the majority, indirect ophthalmoscopy is what can be done. You can turn the baby, you can move around the table, you can do it in the NICU, face the quadrant that you want to examine. These are some of the instruments that uh, we've brought down to low cost, which are available, but otherwise the traditional uh, equipment is used. We are possibly the first country in the world to allow wide field imaging as a accepted method methodology for ROP screening and that too by non-physicians, that is by nurses, optometrists, imaging uh, specialists, of course they have to be certified. So that's where this is, you don't have to be a doctor uh, to screen, you can be a trained technician. This is the Make in India camera, uh, which now has more than 400 installations in FDA and CE approval. I have no financial interest in it, but I was the PI uh, for testing it in the community. And uh, this is now, uh, they are coming out with their angiography unit as well. When do you discharge a baby from screening? Even more important than when you start screening. It's a legal problem. So one should not discharge a baby less than 40 weeks of postmenstrual age because that's when the vessels should have reached the temporal ora serrata. So if you're seeing a baby at 36, 37 weeks and doesn't have ROP, repeat an exam at least four weeks later between 40 and 45. Or of course, if you have a doubt, then just repeat an exam. 
two exams between two weeks saying that there's no disease with the vessels breaching at least zone three or one disc diameter from the aura is good enough. So uh, when you look at an image, when you look at a baby, the diagnosis can be either completely normal, requires treatment or needs follow up. So if you have that in mind, that's the triage that you can train anyone to do either reading as far as reporting of images are concerned or you can do it when you're doing the indirect ophthalmoscopy. The best way to document it is to also hand over an ROP card to the mother where you've written out which day, what time and the venue for the next follow-up. These are all very important caveats from a legal point of view and of course if you have imaging then there is what to do. This uh, our wide field imaging program, the KIDROP has been evaluated uh, in terms of the UNDP and the CDC and this is just one leaf from that report report which says that if you do indirect ophthalmoscopy without proper training and you might miss the findings, it can be a medical legal problem. Now the Indian context to the ICROP3 classification, uh, two of us from India represented the country in the classification. I'm only going to tell you how it is, how we've added and why it's important to us. So aggressive posterior ROP has now gone away and we now call it aggressive ROP. So clearly we've dropped the word posterior, which means that, and as you can see here, even anterior disease, which otherwise looks like, hey, vascularization going up to the zone three can be very ominous and sinister. Look at this capillary non-perfusion in angiogram and look at the uh, red cam picture here. Looks not, doesn't look so bad, but these are the cases that often get misdiagnosed, underdiagnosed, and these can be the worst nightmare. Two more terms were added, regression and reactivation. So regression, incomplete regression is really important. We've added a new term called persistent avascular retina. It's at least two disc diameters of the peripheral retina that has not met, not received the blood supply. Very important in babies who've been injected. Uh, and reactivation, as the word suggests, it will come back. And the comeback pattern can either be vascular, can be a ridge, can be both. Can be in the old disease space, can be in, the, in a new area, can be in both. Which basically means anything can happen and it could be uh, a, regression, uh, a reactivation. So one has to keep out, uh, watch for it. Medical legal, unfortunately, the ugly head has shown. 2015 landmark judgment, July 1st, 1.8 crores. 11 cases after that, including one this year in Rajkot. So what have we learned from it? Well, we've tried to summarize it in this publication. It's free for download, uh, where we've tried to look at how we can mitigate, reduce the incidence of litigation against doctors. Out of all those 11 cases, 10 of them went against the pediatrician. One went against the ophthalmologist and the, doc and the pediatrician. So it's really important uh, not to scare our colleagues in, in neonatology but at least to make them aware that this is a, a serious problem. In terms of technology, I just want to show you that this is now the Anjo device of the Neo. We, we have just completed the clinical trial in the NICU. This is just to show you that it's portable and it's doable. With more and more anti-VEGF being used, uh, FFA seems to be an important tool on how we'll evaluate these babies. We were also the first society in the world to come up with uh, ROP guidelines uh, during the COVID pandemic. It came out as early as March 30th, 2020 uh, and much before uh, social distancing became a thing, we decided, okay, now I'm not able to move my slides. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. So, um, and, and basically what did we change? And I think we've seen the back of the pandemic, but what, what's really important here is that we did allow some gray area and how early we can treat. And those who are not comfortable with laser, we said, go ahead, do the injection and then uh, refer to a place where laser and follow-up can be done. This is uh, a colleague and me trying to laser a COVID positive baby in April 2020 when we had no clue uh, what to do. Uh, sir wanted me to cover a bit of the AI. So in terms of predicting ROP, there's some very exciting work we're doing in Bangalore. Uh, we are now able to take the tears of these babies uh, and looking at the family of proteins that we get in the first screening, we're able to now predict which baby will eventually get the disease. We are not yet quite to the point where we can predict when that disease and whether it will re require treatment or not. The first publication is in IOVS, the second one is coming up shortly, and uh, artificial intelligence. As cost of cameras go down, more and more images go up, it kind of makes intuitive sense that we may need AI algorithms. So this is some work we've been doing. There are other groups, uh, both Dr. Sucheta Kulkarni's group in Pune uh, and uh, uh, Parag's group in Arvind are also collaborating. Uh, so here are uh, algorithms that 
take the, the worst images, pick out the best features and help us make a diagnosis. So that's to summarize what work it is. But AI is uh, will really work only when we can integrate it into an imaging telemedicine program. And this is uh, one of the more recent publications that we did across authorship across many of the centers that you see here. Uh, and this one is a standalone PhD that came out of Chennai, where we are now able to have about a 92% uh, accuracy on whether the image can has stage two or stage three. So that's what you're seeing on your left and on your right. So uh, it's early years, it's about 90%, it's good, it's not awesome, it's work in progress, uh, and it has to be uh, uh, camera agnostic so that we should be able to use it both on the red cam, the neo, and any other new camera that may come. So I'm gonna conclude my talk here. I'd like to thank all our collaborators, beginning with Government of India, and thank you so much for being a patient audience. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Vinayakar for his excellent talk about which really sets the, uh, the the trend going for this instruction course about your screening protocols as well as the role of new technology in the evaluation of ROP. Any questions for Dr. Anand? Can I ask you the first question, Dr. Anand? Sir. What would you think would be an indication for fluorescein angiography if you have the facility available and you would like to give the best for the patient? The one that we're using at our center routinely now is served for those babies who have received anti-VEGF and uh, they have a persistent avascular retina and uh, this is probably the most commonly asked question in our IROP group, when to laser, how long to follow up. Uh, so it's not part of my talk but maybe when it comes in the discussion and we were trying to bring it as IROP guidelines in the SAO meeting in Delhi where we are thinking that we should wait for at least about 48 to 50 weeks, uh, assuming bevacizumab, or the avascular retina is more than two or three disc diameters from the aura, or if there is a very early recurrence that doesn't seem to increase in terms of stage one or two, or doesn't retract as well. So we are now doing FFA guided laser, so to speak. So we do the angio, we demarcate uh, how much avascularity there is, then we look at the age of the baby, the weight of the baby, social factors on whether they can follow up or not, and then decide to treat based on the angiogram. So this is where we are doing angiogram. My question is, would you be able to, in, in the absence of angiographic facility, can you still make out which is a vascular retina and treat it approximately? Absol absolutely, sir. So uh, where do you think it really makes a difference, angiography? Uh, if you're talking about pre-imaging, uh, uh, pre-treatment, uh, then sometimes when the fovea, I probably have some slides on that. The, if the fovea is not perfused, and even if it's zone one or zone two posterior disease, uh, they are great candidates for uh, anti-VEGF as a primary therapy. And if the fovea macula is perfused, uh, and then it's still zone one, or then you, and they do really well with laser as well. Uh, so, and foveal perfusion in terms of capillary perfusion is probably best seen with an angiogram. I think that's where it really helps in terms of differentiating what therapy I would use for the first time. Second question I have is, where do you think a tele ophthalmology as what you have propagated in your excellent model of kid drop study could be misleading? In other words, where could it make it a problem for us to really follow up the case because the information that came from there was totally wrong? Uh, in terms of quality of image, sir, that's where we may go wrong. And less than 5% of unreadable, ungradable images is considered okay for uh, imaging algorithms such as for diabetic retinopathy. Uh, here, I think in ROP, we have a bigger redundancy because a majority of babies do end up being uh, normal. Uh, the only time you would get it uh, mis uh, misleading, I would say, is if there is a complete cutoff between a team that's imaging and the team that is managing these babies is completely remote. Uh, for example, we have been uh, hand-holding a few teams outside Karnataka and if there is no local ownership of the program in that state and if they are high, heavily relying on us from Karnataka to tell them what to do with the baby, then from practical experience I've felt that sometimes the baby's therapy treatment may get lost. It's not so much an uh, image, uh, imaging issue, but it's more a logistic getting together the program kind of an issue. Because there is so much heavy dependence on the fact that, oh, imaging is happening, so uh, you know, screening is happening. And the second experience that we've had in Karnataka is that uh, since we've been doing screening now free of cost in all government hospitals, we've not been able to convince the government to become self-sufficient. Now the Karnataka government believes that this is our project uh, and we are for years now trying to make them self-sufficient for the nurses in the state cadre to be able to take on the screening, uh, somehow that's not happening. So I guess these are more, I don't know whether that answers the questions from a scientific point of view, 
But from a logistic point of view, this is where we are facing the challenge. Very good. Uh, any other? So babies reaching full vascularization before 40 weeks, 38, 39, the many of them, should I repeat the, uh, should, is it mandatory that on, on paper I can mention it as full vascularization and stop this creep? So I mean it depends on how sure you are. If you are doing peripheral scleral depression and you are able to document that uh, and it's reached up to the ora serrata, then go ahead and mention it. Uh, but uh, in terms of just normal vascularization when the uh, temporal ora will receive it around 40, of course, there are many times that it will happen by 37, 38 weeks. So I think the method of examination should be put on paper because some of the law cases, uh, the judges have noted that it was not even mentioned that the pupil was dilated. So how would you convince us that screening was done? Yes. Sir, and a uh, set of babies, twin babies, uh, at two weeks of examination, one of the baby had AROP. Uh, so sir, our guidelines three stands at three weeks and four weeks of... Uh, right, so that has changed. So fortunately, now we can do one screening before discharge. We sometimes screen five days of life. Uh, 13 to 15% of aggressive ROP in our country is seen before the first screening, uh, the first standard screening, which like you said is three to four weeks. So I think uh, that there sometimes the 2010 guidelines may be helpful. Babies born less than 1200, born less than 28 weeks, uh, can be seen between two to three weeks of life. But honestly, uh, I think you will get a sense of which are the APROP or AROP producing factories. At some point when you're screening in many hospitals, you'll know that there is some difference in the level of care or nursing issues there that this hospital, you might want to be more watchful as against another hospital which is hardly producing the disease. So I think that tempo, you'll figure it out. I just want to add to that 40 weeks. See, the thing is that the definition of completely vascularized retina mentioned in books is like completely vascularized retina. But what we realize is that that's not the only factor that tells it should be like you know pupil is fully dilating and dilating very easily the media is completely clear and all the vessels are dichotomously branching and reaching the aura so if you've completed all these factors so out of more than 20,000 babies that i have handled one baby i have written mature retina and patient came back with stage 4a so we can miss so if it was in a hurry or the people was not really dilated and you were not really sure i think it's always makes sense to do one more screening but if you are in ideal conditions you saw people dilated easily and you see the ilm reflex that's also very important you see the good ilm reflex it's not just few vessels reaching the aura it's nicely heavily vascularized then you can release that baby so even at 30 weeks 32 weeks people can be fully vascularized but i don't feel comfortable releasing at 32 weeks because i don't know maybe i'm missing something so i always call back at four weeks once more to see. But if it's 37, 38 weeks, there was no other history, everything is clear, I can release at 38 weeks. Basically, the, the main message is, in general, it's a good habit to at least examine twice. Even if the baby is relatively mature, you think the risk of ROP is very low in such a case. I'm not talking about the cases where you think the risk is high and you may miss a peripheral vascular retina. But even an otherwise normal looking baby, it's always a good practice that you examine twice. The only reason is that sometimes you are in a hurry or the child is crying so much or the pupil is not well dilated. So many reasons why you can potentially miss. So make it a habit. At least examine twice before you declare it as normal. Okay, we'll go to the next talk by Dr. Karobi Lahiri. Can I introduce you? Dr. Karobi is a, a veterinary surgeon from Mumbai. She is a very, very senior uh, ophthalmologist practicing retinopathy of prematurity for many, many, many years. And she has again experience in both the basic care of ROP as well as all the way up to uh, the performance of surgery for complex retinal detachments. Dr. Karobi, for you. Thank you very much, sir, for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, good evening to all of you. Uh, the topic that I'm going to deal with today is the risk factors for uh, ROP with potential mitigation. Now, as we all know that ROP is a two-phase process where the first phase is that of hyperoxia and the decrease in angiogenic factors which causes vasoobliteration followed by the second phase of hypoxia which is an increase in angiogenic factors and secondary vasoproliferation. The risk factors which are there revolve around these factors primarily. Now prevention is better than cure so uh, a proper prenatal counseling uh, is very important because a preterm birth 
Uh, I think uh, it causes a little bit of uh, echo. Is it giving an echo? It's okay. It's okay. Okay, a preterm birth uh, is due to a in utero exposure to infection and inflammation. So idea is that if you are preventive in getting a preterm baby born, you have uh, sort of won a big battle. So now the common in, uh, the current interventions are involving the obstetricians, the pediatricians, the midwifery nurses, the neonatologists, the nurses in the NICU, and the ophthalmologists towards preventing premature la labor and delivery. Uh, the administration of antenatal steroids is supposed to be helpful and to dis decrease any perinatal uh, inflammatory conditions. Now, when we come to the maternal and environmental risk factors, reducing these also could prevent the problem of uh, premature deliveries like smoking, drinking, drugs in the mother. The mother should not be less than 17 or greater than 35. Stress, low socioeconomic status, abuse, overworking, is these are also stress factors. And exposure to air pollution, lead, and radiation and chemicals like paint, plastic and smoke is these are factors to be avoided to try to get a normal bill, a delivery, a delivery which is at term. Now the remedy is that you advise to the contrary, that is the gynecs have to spend potential time with the parents and create an awareness of what can be if they don't adhere to these norms. So it requires a little time spending. Now once the child is uh, on its way, uh, the important things which cause the prevention of ROP, uh, I mean, or the acceleration of ROP, is low gestational birth weight, uh, uh, gestational age, low birth weight. Uh, anemia and blood transfusion play a major role, and administration of oxygen more than seven days in a particular concentration. The other factors are those of the apnea and bag and mask ventilation, the res uh, respiratory distress syndrome leading to IVH, and surfactant therapy. So as we know, there is a risk factor score. That is, you find that the lower gestational age, lower birth weights are more prone to developing ROP, as we all know. But there are a lot of associated risk factors which also can be dealt with. That is, if you have patients of IVF pregnancies, be very careful because normally it always lands up with multiple births. Very few are single birth babies. And these are children who are prone to have cerebral palsy. Now, in the delivery room, there are certain risks which put the child at risk. And these are also supposed to be known. That is a difficulty in transition, cold stress, and the lung immaturity, which causes an RDS and later intraventricular hemorrhages. These are uh, uh, statuses which you could avoid by use of warmer blankets. The AC should be off in the NICU and swat the baby nicely in proper clothes and uh, uh, sometimes even sweaters and keep them in the baby crib. Now the newer risk factors uh, there are certain systemic risk factors which are there, which is that is of uh, the patient could be asphyxiated, it could be hypoxic, convulsions and shock, acidosis, alkalosis, hyper and hypocarbia, hyperglycemia, even hypoglycemia, jaundice and sepsis. These are all risk factors which predispose to the development of ROP. And certain other factors are blood transfusions, parenteral nutrition, uh, which is important, which is not given many a times, early intubations, uh, hypotension, uh, administration of beta blockers to the mother, and candida sepsis. These are other new risk factors which predispose. So if you see a child who is born of ROP can have problems in the lung, that is, the child can have a bronchopulmonary dysplasia or an asthma, and these asthma-like symptoms persist throughout the life. In the intestine, they could have a necrotizing enterocolitis. Infections like pneumonia and meningitis are common. Vision problems of ROP, hearing losses can be there, and dental problems are there. So on certain analysis which was done, the gestational age, younger and lighter birth weight, postnatal hypotension, inotropes use, bronchopulmonary dysplasia, intraventricular hemorrhages were common independent risk factors for development of ROP and 
especially the type 1. And on a multivariate analysis, it was found all these other factors, along with thrombocytopenia, intraventricular hemorrhages, total parenteral nutrition, and hypoglycemia were significant risk factors for ROP. Now, the RDS is an incidence which can occur in all premature infants. The lower the gestational age to 37 weeks, especially diabetic mothers, multiple gestations, and surfactant deficiencies are prone to this, which is evidenced by nasal flaring, cyanosis, and tachypnea. The intraventricular hemorrhages are due to oxygen delivery fluctuations and oxidative stress, which promote hypoxic ischemic and reperfusion injuries, which cause ROP development. And 50% of these children can die. And they generally affect children less than 28 weeks of gestation. The apnea of prematurity affects about 50% of the NICU infants. Again, the symptoms, the signs are those of cyanosis, bradycardia, pallor, and hypotonia. And there is cessation of respiration for 10 seconds or 15 seconds. So you know this is an apnea. And if you have it during procedures, you can just tap the foot of the baby. The baby starts crying then. The neonatal factors, other factors, newer risk factors are inhaled nitric, nitric oxide, erythropoietin uh, delivery, dopamine treatment, caffeine treatment, and thrombocytopenia. Now, can prematurity affect the brain? Yes, it can. It lead, can lead to long-term intellectual and developmental disabilities. And the disabilities run to the form of physical development, learning, communicating with others, getting along with others, taking care of himself, and also behavioral issues like ADHD, ADD, anxiety neurological disorders, cerebral palsy, and autism spectrum disorders. So certain beauty, I already mentioned to you about the multiple births, and infants who are born with CP have an incidence of vascular anomalies. And also there is an association between <coughs> genetic issues and Norris disease, FER, and ROP. Erythropoietin, again, is used to reduce the need for red blood cell transfusions in preterm, and that is also a prominent risk factor. Favorable factors have been told to be that of preeclampsia, uh, administration of antenatal steroids, administration of vitamin E is doubtful because there's no uh, kind of study on that. They say administration of human milk is good because it increases the level of IGF-1 phototherapy. So one can say that human milk, it causes the level of IGF-1 increase, and that it uh, uh, causes, uh, 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 it's crucial for physiological retinal vascularization, and its lack can lead to impaired retinal vascularity and ROP. So what are the remedies? The remedies to get less ROP is oxygen monitoring, infection control, look after the nutrition, the temperature control, supportive developmental care, and pain control. And there are certain pathologic and physiologic factors which regulate all the vital signs. There are heart rate, pulse oximetry, respiratory system, and blood pressure monitoring. These require constant monitoring right from the time that the child is born. So you can, in turn, uh, change alert certain parameters of the physi physiologic determinants, uh, determinants and the pathologic conditions which predispose to ROP. Now, what are the preventions of ROP, the do's and don'ts? Use a pulse oximeter soon after birth in whichever way, whether the child is in the NICU or being transferred or during the NICU stay. And what is important, maintain a target SpO2 of about 88 to 92%. Avoid large changes of the FiO2 during desaturation and decrease by 5% every time. Also, the FiO2 recommendations for resuscitation is 30 to 90% only. And it takes about five minutes for the SpO2 levels to get this just after birth. Avoid oxygen administration if the baby has good respiratory efforts. And if you're using any of the uh, this, you can remove the reservoir so that a certain concentration of FiO2 will be there, that is 40%. And if you're using Neopuff, that is also a good oxygen air blender, which helps out. So lower and more tightly controlled saturation limits also reduces the severity of ROP and any adverse effects, especially those of BPD and neurological symptoms. 
Sepsis, again, you strict aseptic precautions are always taken in the NICU. And also when there are IV fluids being prepared, you have to prepare it with a lot of caution and don't interrupt the IV infusion lines. Prevention of ROP, again, look after the uh, nutrition of the baby. And TPN is for all the babies less than 31 and 1250 grams. Avoid hypotension. Uh, that is a mean BP as per norms of uh, uh, mentioned. And miscellaneous factors is that, again, the steroids, vitamin E, and light exposure. So the five common things that you will look after is supplemental oxygen exposure, hyperoxemia, hypo oxemia, positive pressure ventilation, because you can go a long way in reducing all the effects that it causes. So until ROP can be prevented, you, by knowing the underlying etiology and a modification of risk factors, it goes a long way towards prevention of the disease at prenatal or early postnatal levels, thereby reducing the incidence of ROP. Thank you very much for your kind attention. <coughs> Uh, thank you, Dr. Karabi. I do understand that most of what you have mentioned is in the in the domain of the neonatologist to be able to conduct the obstetrician so that they prevent an early delivery and then prevent ROP. And once the baby is born, the neonatologist takes care of all these things, which ophthalmologists cannot influence. But it's important that as ophthalmologists, we are aware of what are the factors. And there are situations where we may still have an important role to play. May I ask you? What would be your uh, take on if you, if you were to track the NICUs in a given city, and track the energy use, track track the NICUs, NICUs okay. and do you think it's important that we give a feedback to the neonatologist that among the ten cases or fifteen cases that you have referred, so many had ROP and so many had AP ROP, etc. Would you without making it you know too dramatic? just as a feedback, so that they are understand where they stand with respect to the incidence of ROP. It becomes a sensitive issue between you and the neonatologist. But without upsetting the apple cart, you can still pass on the message. Because this is where we tend to fail. Yes. Because, because of professional uh, reasons, we don't inform them what we should inform ideally. Do you think it can be made like a standard protocol that at the end of six months or one year, we give them a feedback. Uh, very true, sir, because uh, even in metropolitan cities like Mumbai, we still have places where they don't do a primary examination for the child before the child is discharged and the child goes home. He spends three months at home getting well and then after that the parents realize there's a white reflex and they come up at stage five. There are still centers in metropolitan cities. I'm not talking about uh, the uh, villages or wherever where there's scant amount. So what you say, sir, is very right because this kind of awareness, if we sort of do it, and we do it many a times because I have spoken to one of uh, two or three of these uh, places which don't have this screening protocol in place. I mean, in fact, we've invited them for our CMEs that we've had on <clears throat> various aspects. And we inform, means it's an indirect way of informing them that yes, these are the norms that you have to follow. And uh, for that, the target population means we ask the pediatricians to contact their people and they have a seminar and we go and speak or you know some uh, the uh, uh, people who are the nurses if they have uh, this we also uh, inform them because that would go a long way in uh, deciding whatever so forget all that there are also many a times a lot of ophthalmologists who inadvertently use uh, anti vegf injections and the follow up is not proper so the more trickier part is here rather than the other pediatricians. So that is also one area which we want to tackle, but that is very difficult. Okay. The second question I have for you is, there is a situation where the ophthalmologist can play a very important role in preventing progression at least. There is a child admitted in the NICU and needs a general surgery for something else. Now, how as an ophthalmologist, when they very often ask you, is the child okay for me to put under GA? Because under GA, the oxygen monitoring is different. Oxygen levels are exposure to oxygen is a lot different from in the NICU itself, where they can control it better. But there is a question of life and death of the child, so they may have to give a lot of oxygen. So the neonatologist is indeed worried to put the child under general anesthesia. But if they have to put the child under general anesthesia, they have a time frame to choose from. 
how would you guide the neonatologist when they to take up for GA based upon your ocular examination? So at least the first seven days they could avoid where, you know, all the fluctuations which are there, they could have managed that. The oxygen concentrations can be altered as per the requirement, not keeping a 100% saturation in the first few periods. And when there is a modicum of stability, that is would be the time that the child could be taken up for any kind of special, especially there are certain uh, intestinal obstructions children come with, or they have uh, these kind of uh, hydrocephalus, which has to be sort of uh, a reservoir has to be put over there. So in those cases, we tell them to bide a little time till the child is a little stable, and then do the surgery after that. Uh, may I uh, may I uh, sh share something with you? I think the question which was asked by Dr. Lingam Gopal uh, was about we have this I have seen long time back. Uh, we had certain pockets from where fertile ground of a APROP, and uh, I made it a point. Although I became uh, sort of a person at times, it was a, a, a problem, but. I made it a point that I would call, and uh, I, I can even tell you the towns from where we have got the maximum numbers. So I think it's very important that you have to call back that your place, we are getting maximum number of babies with aggressive pussy ROP, very bad ROP, and their number is so huge. So I think uh, once we communicate to them that they have to change their protocol, or they can talk to us a bigger center like in where I worked all my life, PGI, because we don't see ROP coming from PGI. So there's a definite uh, evidence. So the biggest problem for us today in India is suboptimal neonatal care. If it is not suboptimal, we don't get ROP. All good centers, any good NICU, if you have, you will not get even single case for treatment. They'll mostly regress of its own. I think that is experience of most of us, those who have worked in bigger centers. Maybe as an extension to what Dr. Dogra said, India is unfortunately a very complex country with very heterogeneous relationship between ophthalmologists and the neonatologists. You come from a government hospital and you can tell something which will be accepted or they cannot really act back against you. But a lot of private institutions will be really concerned about expressing in the same strong terms that you could express. So there can be a via media protocol where, as I said, every three months or four months or five months, we just send them a report these are the cases you This is just a feedback. No exaggerated remarks, nothing whatsoever. Of how many cases you sent, these are the cases of ROP, et cetera, et cetera. This is the international standards usually that we expect in a China person with 1,200 grams or 1,500 grams. What do we expect? So at least they know where they stand without us specifying the same. That may be a via media approach, but still it's important to give a feedback however subtle it is, otherwise we will remain the same way we are. Even five years from now, we still keep getting APROPs for no reason in patients who are 1300 grams and above. Nowhere in the world, a 1500 grams and above child needs a laser treatment. It's only in India we keep treating 1500 grams, 1500 grams, etc. People coming with stage five ROP with 1500 grams and above is unheard of anywhere else in the world. That's mainly because of the improper care. Maybe we should not use the word improper. That's why, as I said, a subtle way of, of conveying the message is rather important for us to reduce the risk. Yeah, Dr. Gopal, I yeah. would just like to add two things. One, there were two best units in my city. And one day, one of the unit person asked me, do you see more ROP from my unit or from the other unit? I said, I cannot reveal the data, but I can tell you I'm doing more lasers in your unit than the other. He was devastated. He said, how can that be? I'm the best. You know, and you are saying that you have more laser. I said, I don't know. You talk to your colleague. Definitely there's something. You talk to them and find out what are their practices, what are your practices. Today, then they talk to each other. And they found out where they were, you know, missing up things. So I didn't have to talk. I just gave them the direction. Today, in either of them, I don't see. But I think it's like you know, the new daughter-in-law coming to the house and, you know, uh, giving all directions. When you get referrals from somewhere, first of all, you need to build your confidence with them. You build your confidence with them, you show them that you are really doing a good job with the babies they sent you, and then you start your dialogue with them once they have confidence in your capability, your capacity. Then they are willing to listen. They are willing to listen. And yeah, I think it's very important that we start to take them because Rahim is 
to make things better for the child, not to unnecessarily get into the confrontation or saying who is better. That's not the approach. The approach is to take the neonatologist with you and they should have confidence in you that you are only trying to help them and not to be offensive towards them. It's very, very important. There is no one-upmanship here. Now, the third talk is by Dr. Mangatram Dogra. He again needs no introduction to this audience. Dr. Dogra was the professor of uh, ophthalmology and vitreoretinal surgery in PGI Chandigarh, one of the premier institutes in this country. He has, given, he has done a lot of fundamental work in the field of ROP and has contributed a lot, especially in the field of laser photocoagulation. Dr. Dogra. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Lingam Gupal, for this opportunity for me. Uh, I think you have to yeah, go to my slides, yes. So uh, I think uh, this has been my most favorite topic, talking for so many years all around. And this is something which is changing drastically. Uh, I do have some financial disclosures here that I have been a speaker as well as uh, on their advisory board, some of these companies, but uh, nothing to do with the treatment of ROP. Uh, I think laser treatment, as we know, uh, uh, has been a standard of care for a long time. I put it was. It is a now big question mark. It is changing. So I don't know whether it is still for all type one, may not be. And uh, of course, it is delivered in a confident fashion and 90% around that would attain favorable outcome as seen in this particular case. And uh, we did propagate and this started from our center with our, uh, two of our publications uh, and one way back where uh, I think diode laser was considered that you must buy diode. Uh, well, there's no need, nobody does that. I think many people now, they use the same laser which you use for that is the green laser or 532 laser. And this is one such, uh, they be treated with the same. And uh, there's another one you can see here, recent one, this I shared by Dr. Diksha with me. And uh, you can see uh, how in 10 days time, the vessel straighten up and it's an excellent treatment. And we have done this laser for a very, very long time. And uh, another one, role of posterior barrage laser in selected cases, especially if you have something like stage three, fibrovascular proliferation, and you have 4A. And uh, in certain situation like 4A, maybe many a time you want to avoid, uh, or the proliferation is too much, I think you can do posterior, and that is what you see here has been done. And you can see very good result in a 4A even. So I think uh, some of these modality, we don't have to kind of forget about them and we don't have to be going all the way. And of course, I, this has been shown by Anand, we can treat through the wall of the incubator. The problem is here. Most of the ROP which we see is from outside, not in your hospital, which these babies born. And it's mostly AP ROP in this country, aggressive pussy ROP. And they usually don't do that well in our own series way back, it was like around 71% had a favorable outcome. We also looked at some of these factors. If you have a posterior zone one, although this term is not used, and it's not been picked up by ICROP, but this is something where uh, you have a very severe disease where it stops at uh, almost fovea. This is half of uh, what we have zone one. And if you have a pre-existing fibrovascular proliferation, same thing happens and uh, you may uh, have progression. Pre-retinal hemorrhages or any case who, which will need a repeat laser. By and large, if you do a good job, you don't do. But other case which is progressing, you may still find some areas and you'd like to go in. But those are the cases may uh, have a problem and go to detachment. One of the things which we saw, this is the only first publication exclusive on posterior zone one, and somebody called it uh, like zone half also, that uh, almost 79% had unfavorable outcome with laser treatment. So you can imagine the, uh, if we had only if we to, to a laser in these cases, so they are mostly going to go. In fact, there are uh, cases reported from Chile and some other places by Kintal and uh, other group where they had 100% unfavorable outcome in such cases. And uh, I'll show you one such case here. You can see despite uh, fairly good laser, ultimately in this case, this was a posterior zone one, these stretch break uh, develops 
Uh, and what you can do now, even if you are an excellent surgeon, you put in uh, oil or whatever, I think it will be a very difficult situation. So anti vegf we have to understand now at this time, they, most of the AP ROP and Zone 1 ROP require anti vegf first. And that is accepted mostly. And this has happened after, uh, especially already mentioned here in the keynote uh, direct, uh, nicely and uh, by the various trials. And what has happened, what we were doing earlier, when we were doing a conventional laser, you see the first one, we were going inside zone one. We did all the time. We have plenty of cases and with success. But you can see we have left just a tube there. And subsequently, what was done, the anti vegfs were given, the zone one was spared. Then so it was realized that no, we can hold on, we can wait and do a laser, which is a deferred laser, which should be done much later, let the vessels grow. And uh, so I think sometimes, you see, that is what we know now, that laser is not required if the vessels reach zone three or aura serrata without the reactivation. I think uh, Anand talked about that. And ideal, I already mentioned, is deferred laser. You look up for the signs of progression and then you do it. And anti vegf injection will be followed by, as I said, maybe you need very uh, uh, less amount of laser and you will not kill that much of retina. Again, recent case shared by Dr. Diksha with me, posterior zone one. This is what we were talking. We even suggested in that study uh, when it was published in Canadian Journal that if we inject anti vegf and subsequently do a laser, deferred laser, they will do much better. So you can see here the story, what happens. This baby, two weeks after ILEA, then five weeks after ILEA, and then this is nine weeks after ILEA. And then it is being followed, and 16 weeks after ILEA, or 56 weeks of PCA, there is some progression of vascularization into the posterior zone too. And it is very nicely seen. That is where the role of now, look at, look at the angiogram. How happy you are that it has gone much beyond but the reactivation is happening and so is in the other eye. Now the whole uh, macular area is vascularized. So you are confident. I'm not even showing you subsequently the laser and other things. That is where you'll have to do laser now. And this is definitely otherwise would have led to if only the laser was done in the beginning. So I think that is where and the combination treatment here is a deferred laser. And of course, uh, we have now recent evidence. This is a publication you will must have seen recently, just last month, in the month of April. Uh, I think this is from this big uh, uh, consortium, consortium of uh, retinopathy of prematurity injection group, where it's very interesting to see that, that ranibizumab use was associated with a higher rate of retreatment than vivacizumab. Everybody felt, but it is now there is a evidence, 58% versus 37%. The retreatment group had a larger percentage of aggressive posterior ROP. We also knew it, but now we need some evidence. And this is again 34 versus 18%. And the greater percentage of zone 1 ROP. I mean, again, we knew it. Then the no treatment group. I mean, so th these are all uh, important evidences. And we also know that although we have only approval for ranibizumab, and it is available, at least in India, I believe, on Janani program, and everybody is using these days Razumab. I think you should come out with a study and uh, from all the big hospitals. And that is uh, something, I mean, which is a approval from DCGI. So in conclusion, what I would like to highlight about laser treatment is that later treatment is still considered standard of care for ROP. I put a question mark. I don't know, it is not for all ROP, that is for sure. Most would use anti vegf for first for AP ROP and zone one ROP, most. This is across the world, which I, I keep looking at all the publications. And anti vegf injection will be followed by need for less that I have shown. And that is what you don't do immediate laser, wait. Let it vascularize, let it, even if you see clear sign of recurrences later on, you can do that. And also, I think very nicely you had shown that the number of second injection given are not that many. Their number is smaller as compared to the laser treatment done, which is much more. So that is also very important. And 
indication for needs uh, laser needs modification which is come, going to come it is my hunch that like in diabetic retinopathy now laser is a adjunctive treatment so will be for rop down the line it will be adjunctive treatment not the mainstay of treatment that is what would happen this is my own uh, this uh, just a presumption thank you very much uh, thank you dr dogra um, i thought the next talk will probably overlap a little bit with this talk can we have the discussion on both together dr parijat maybe you can Uh, Dr. Paparjat is the professor of ophthalmology at the RP Center, and he has again tremendous experience in the field of ROP, both medical treatment and the surgical management. Dr. Paparjat, thank you, sir. So, uh, right. So, I'll be talking about anti-VEGF and ROP. So, I'll be building on what Dr. Uh, Tarik has already said and some concepts which Dr. Dogra has very nicely elucidated. So, I'll just build a little on that and uh, I'll try to give you a picture of what we are doing at AIMS New Delhi. So uh, this was the outcome which we used to see uh, in a very nicely lasered case of zone 1 ROP and we used to be very happy about it. But now there are several problems in this photograph. You will see that there's limited visual field uh, which has a tubular vision and poor macular perfusion. If you do an FA you will find possibly it's there and there's a risk of high myopia. So can we do better than this? So obviously for the last few years anti vegf has emerged as the first line of treatment in zone 1 ROP. It allows for rapid ROP regression. Retinal revascularization, which will lead to better visual field, better foveal structure, less refractive changes. And obviously, if you compare it with laser, it's a much faster procedure, causes less pain, which is again a major concern with laser and a more stable baby systemically once you do these kind of procedures. So, uh, as in Protonite earlier, that rainbow trial showed superiority of uh, ranizumab with laser, and therefore, Anobatis uh, announced that uh, uh, ranizumab had approved uh, in the European Union uh, for treatment. Subsequently, now for a few months back, uh, ILA has also been approved by the FDA for treatment of ROP. This was following the Firefly and the Butterfly Eye studies and this is uh, the Firefly study which has been published recently and which showed that uh, this showed a similar effect. However, the non-inferiority of aflibercept could not be demonstrated. So let me show you some current use scenarios which we use it right now. So this is a case of uh, aggressive ROP. You can see the pupil is not dilating. There's extensive new vascularization in the pupillary area and now you can't do surgery or laser or whatever you want in these eyes. So what do you do? You inject these eyes and see what happens in the next three days. So this kind of magic is only possible with anti vegf drugs which was never possible with any other kind of treatment earlier. And you see in three days the entire new vascularization has disappeared and the pupil is dilating so well and now you can go ahead and do whatever procedure, laser or surgery, whatever you want. This is typically a photo of aggressive ROP as it looks like now and a newcomer finds it very difficult to uh, deal with these cases, how where to laser, how much to laser, so you can see the macula is also not vascularized, you know, so what to do in these eyes. So anti vegf takes care of a lot of these problems as it allows the revascularization to happen and these loops to disappear. So just to show you a case, uh, I marked out uh, by the white lines just in case you can't uh, appreciate it there, this is a case of posterior zone 1 aggressive ROP as you can see here and if you go ahead and laser this nothing much is going to be left there even you can see the macula is also not vascularized so what do you do so don't go ahead go ahead and you know laser these eyes you inject and this is what it looks like at four weeks so you can see there is a significant vascularization happens in most of these cases I'm not saying all but most of these cases significant vascularization will happen and then for you continue to let it grow don't just inject and do laser in three days let it grow and you might have a much bigger area with which uh, the child will be able to see. This is showing another case where you know a st uh, stage 4 is developing here. There's just again a posterior zone 1 ROP. You can see some pre-retinal hemorrhage there. And this is uh, 4 weeks after injection. You can see again the retina has grown. The PVD has happened, that white tissue. And uh, you know surgery could be avoided in this case and you have a much better seeing retina in this case. This is a situation which possibly you will encounter again very frequently. The eye has already been lasered. There's a uh, stage 4A happening. And the, you can see extensive new vascularization is there in this photograph. <laughs> So what we like to do in these cases, along with surgery, we like to combine it with anti vegf injections at the end of surgery under air. Uh, so you see this kind of outcome is absolutely not possible if you do surgery alone. This can only be possible with combination therapy. And if you do surgery alone, there's a high chance you can end up with, uh, you know, interop uh, uh, bleed, post-op bleed, or the retina may just pucker over because a very small retina in there is zone 1. If you do anti vegf alone, then again, there's a chance again it might bleed, again might pucker over and might contract. So, you know, there's a, uh, a combination of this works very well. 
So this is a case again, I want to show you some of the newer indications which we are trying out right now. As Dr. Dogra said that newer indications are needed for this and that is where we are reaching. And eventually we are uh, reaching, I agree with Dr. Dogra, it was more of pharmacological treatment of ROP and laser possibly while stay as an adjunct. So uh, this is a case of uh, stage three, you can see what is happening here. You inject uh, along with laser treatment and this is just five days post uh, 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 injection and laser in this eye. So what I'm just trying to tell you here in case of threshold ROP where there's extensive neovascularization happening, possibly in a case like this, uh, where there's a higher chance that the case might progress despite laser, you might consider adding anti vigif along with it in one or two days. And this will lead to much better outcome and will make the response much more predictable. If you do a laser in the side, there's a high chance it might still continue to progress and might go into sequelae. But if you combine it, uh, it might be a more predictable outcome. So it's important to know that this is not a magic drug and if you continue to inject it in every eye then things can go wrong. So this was a case which came to us, this case is lasered, you can see it's again going into 4A. So this case we advised surgery, however the referring surgeon decided to continue and do an anti vigif injection. So in one week you know it's already gone into stage 4B, so it's not a magic drug, do not continue to inject in cases where it is not indicated. In some cases surgery might be more valuable than an anti vigif injection. So if a surgery is indicated, it's better to go for surgery and not do anti vigif in this size. So which drug to use? So a lot of these drugs are available in the market. All of them work very well. All of them have uh, have a good regression pattern. Although uh, it's been reported in literature that Ilia and uh, Bevesuzumab have a longer acting action, have less recurrences than Ranizumab. Biosimilar, so we are using Ranizumab now because it's in the hospital supply, we are using it for a long time now. And we find the effect is similar exactly to uh, Lucentis or Eccentrix, which is available. Half dose is usually being prescribed, uh, but many people believe still it's a much larger dose for a preterm baby. So you will find reports of 1-4 dose, one ten dose, ultra low doses. Uh, the only problem which I see with this is that if, as you continue to go in smaller doses, already is like just one or two drops which go inside the eye. If you go to a very low dose, uh, injecting and calibrating it is very difficult and it will just come out from the same port and you know nothing uh, might happen. So uh, you just need to be careful about that. And uh, ultra low doses in literature have also shown to have high recurrence rates. So how many injections? Usually one injection works very well and obviously I'll just come to the reactivation part uh, just after this. And uh, uh, But many people like to give multiple injections as well so I'll just come to that. So systemic concerns are there, they have been there for a long time, they have been there for the last 10 years and multiple reports are there. Uh, what we need to understand through this is that uh, although the side effects have been reported systemically in different different studies through various meta-analysis, the level of evidence right now is very low. So you need to consider the risk-benefit ratio because the benefit is significant in zone 1 ROP. And you also need to, so we did a Cochrane study also about this and again the same thing is there. A lot of reports are there, a lot of case reports are there, but the level of evidence right now is low. So you need, which also signifies that you should not use this indiscriminately. We really don't know. Right now we really don't know. Five years is a very small period, ten years is a very small period. Maybe something else will come out later. So you should not use it indiscriminately. Use it with considered risk benefit ratio. We like to inject it in the operation theater. Many people like to inject in the NICU. We prefer to do it in the operation theater where you know have a full sterile environment. You have the magnification of the OT microscope where you can inject in a more controlled manner. Uh, we like to inject bilaterally in the same setting. Obviously you need to take parent consent and you need to do it as you need to change the syringe, you need to change the uh, the op site and gloves etc. and take all possible care. So just a quick word on the challenges which are there. So we get a lot of cases coming with cataract, a lot of the cases coming with end of cell mitis to our center which are all injected outside. So we just need to be aware that uh, these problems happen. So if you do it in the operation theater, you do it under proper magnification, these problems can be avoided. Peripheral avascular retina is a concept came out in ICROP3. It's a reality. So you inject, it grows 80% and then it stops growing. Then what do you do? So if you leave a large PAR unattended, there's a chance of late reactivation. There's a chance that these peripheral retinal changes may occur when child is 5 years old, 10 years old. So we prefer if the, if the retina is avascular, it stops growing over a period of time. Then around in 12 weeks, if it's still not grown uh, after injection, then we tend to go ahead and laser it when it's still laserable and GA is not needed. But some babies obviously become bigger and GA might be needed. Managing reactivation right now is the biggest problem which is there in Ranizumab because uh, these drugs are short acting. As I told you before, Aflibercept and Bevacizumab are more longer acting and have a more sustained response with lesser reactivation as reported in literature. So reactivation we manage with laser treatment. And mostly after this, the disease uh, does tend to settle down. But you have to maintain a high index of suspicion for this uh, and, you know, uh, take care of it in time. Just the last one or two slides, uh, when to do repeat injection. 
so sometimes you know the reactivation patient comes late or uh, you know it's like 12 weeks or 10 weeks patient comes and suddenly you know he breaks follow up he's sick or something and comes with a very severe kind of reactivation and laser as we understand needs time to act so if you don't have time for laser then maybe you can buy time by injecting and you can do a laser simultaneously this case i'm trying to show you here is uh, 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 patient underwent an injection then he reactivated then laser was done he then reactivated again a second injection someone gave again and again he reactivated this is how he came to us so you know this is again a very common thing which is happening right now injections have been given once or twice and the patient has already been lasered and the child is again reactivating so what we are doing right now in these cases we switch to avastin and then mostly it just holds on after that so you can consider switching if the child is reactivating again and again uh, some possible indications uh, if you want to use them uh, again with a possible risk benefit ratio if there's a poor regrowth and there's extensive power at 12 weeks and it's just zone 2 posterior then possibly you might try to inject again if you wanted to grow more if there's a poor regrowth and it reactivates and again it's again a very small zone obviously you can laser in both these situations very well but uh, some people i have uh, observed they like to uh, reactivate uh, and then like to reinject again in these cases in the hope that it will grow more and we have also observed and sometimes it tends to grow more again it might come into zone 2 anterior and then you can possibly go ahead and do laser in these eyes and just uh, concluding uh, so a huge shout out to the jssk program of the government of india if some of you are in government service you can uh, you know uh, opt your uh, department to opt for the jssk program it's a program of government of india which allows for free transport diagnostic and treatment to these babies because of which we are able to give free treatment in government hospitals uh, for these expensive injections in these uh, babies thank you so much uh, thank you dr parjat for having given us a um, overview about the role of anti vegf so before i ask questions is there anybody from the audience would like to ask sir uh, thank you uh, i just have a small actually my personal experience uh, with the second injection uh is similar to the case that was shown by dr parejat uh with a stage 3 treated elsewhere referred with a reactivation and uh, recurrence of the plus disease so i did give a second injection but there was such a bad crunch that i have stopped giving second injections and especially i would like to look at the periphery of the retina reexamine again for any missed or skip areas and especially if the child is more than 42 43 weeks i would be very very concerned for giving a second injection especially in situations like that just my personal experience yeah so uh, i i um, i think we give lot of second injections uh, because we get a lot of these cases with the reactivation post laser mostly most of them are referred to us so if the child is already injected lasered once or twice outside and he still comes back with the reactivation actually there's nothing else to do so the third injection as dr deeksha rightly pointed out should be done only when the reactivation is early if you have a reactivation which is already uh, detaching or in a more advanced level of stage then it's better to combine it with the surgery otherwise you will get a, a crunch effect and then it become even more difficult to manage especially if it's a very small zone it'll just crunch over and close and then you will have a you know more anxious parent that what did you do and uh, this is there so we pick up early reactivation for all these cases i showed you early reactivation you can try all this if it's late then possibly surgery might be a better option you like to say uh, i'd like to ask uh, about your opinion on the pallor of the disc and the effect that it might have on the vision after injection especially repeat injection the pallor of the disc and the uh, the disc pallor uh, it looks paler than those with uh, laser and the arteries also look thinner so especially with repeat injection uh, what do you think the pallor of the disc will have uh, on the vision of the child okay so uh, regarding what you said uh, i think madam has already shown that uh, study which was just uh, presented by dr kari that after injection this is observed you know the vessels become very thin and narrow and all this but eventually this thing you know fixes itself up but um, having said that i think it's also very important to understand there's a chance of consecutive optic atrophy you know if if a large amount of laser is done and you keep on doing this again and again there is a chance that uh, as you said that uh, disc can start get to pale the retina can start to uh, become like this so uh, again this again all with a pinch of salt it has to be done so as i'm saying this all risk benefit ratio has to be taken i'm not advocating multiple injections at all i'm just saying in particular case scenarios you might 
consider using it. Otherwise, one injection and laser works very well in most of the cases, and uh, I'm, it should not be mostly done. So. Can I make a comment? Uh, in the days when the FDA approvals were not there for anabizumab and uh, now for Ilia, we were more happy because that one shot of Avastin really did the job for us and it settled off and then after uh, some time you could just uh, laser the peripheral uh, vascular, avascular area. Uh, I just wanted to ask sir, in today's, with the evidence that we have today, would it be right to say that anti vegf is the first line or the standard of care for zone 1 ROP or would you, would you like to say that combined treatment is the standard of care? So I think it's the same thing. Uh, I, I would agree that zone 1 may it's better to inject first and obviously it eventually it becomes a combination only. It grows and 6 to 8 weeks come back and you do laser. So eventually it's a combination treatment if you see in the end of the story. So if you give Avastin or Vesbab then the recurrence and the need for second session of treatment, any other treatment is less than 10 to 12 percent. If you use Razumab or Ensweb, already the evidence is presented, then almost 50 to 60 percent would need second treatment. But that would also depend on, I think we have we are missing the one point very important is that all these babies need systemic therapy. Almost everybody who comes to me with reactivation is somebody where the anemia was not corrected. Their hemoglobin is 6 and 7. The day the baby comes to you for ROP screening, the day you give the injection, the day you start the laser, you must get a hemoglobin done and make sure that it's 10 or above. Those babies and the data is also published, if they have poor weight gain or anemia, they will do poorly. So while you're treating the eye, please treat the system also. Don't ignore that. Then your retreatments will come down. One area where I have, I rarely re-inject because I use only Avastin, but one area where I have re-injected is sometimes when the injection was given, it had no effect. So if by two weeks you see no effect, that means either the drug had extravasated or it was not maintained in cold chain or it was a spurious drug and it had no effect. So we should, the effect that we expect, we should see that, that the vessels have become narrow, the disease has quietened. You know, if you don't see that effect, then you better inject earlier rather than wait for it to, you know, you, you imagine that it is responding, but it's not responding. Uh, I, I just have to uh, mention uh, two things. Uh, one is about uh, the dose part. I think uh, now several studies are published. If you are going to give low dose, you're going to have a very high recurrence. So that is very well known. And uh, another thing is, I think uh, what is happening is if we are not lasering this peripheral retina and it is left there, so the late problems which we are seeing, you see, the laser treatment was very good. You laser to ora serrata. So you'll never have detachment, other issues, and very few cases would have that. Rather spontaneously regressed cases would have that. So I think we are going to enter into another phase and we have to be prepared for that, that we'll have a lot of those things happening there. Yeah. Uh, I'm sorry that we need to stop the questions here because other two talks are to be completed. If time permits, we will continue the discussion. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I'm so happy that all of you are here and I'm going to speak about the surgical techniques. I'm not here to teach you surgery, but just to give you the approach. The first thing is why should I be doing surgery when, you know, Dr. Jalali and Lingam Gopal are anyway doing. So let's just stick to the injections and the laser. So I just want to tell that all of us retina surgeons who are doing the pediatric retina surgeries, we are overwhelmed with cases. There are too many cases. Dr. I used Shudra, to operate till late in the night. I can interrupt you. I'm extremely sorry, I apologize that I didn't introduce the star of India for ROP, Dr. Subhadra Jalali. She is a very senior consultant in Delvi Pasada Institute and has trained hundreds of people in the management of ROP in this country and elsewhere. And uh, along with Professor Azad, Dr. Dogra, Dr. Subhadra has contributed immensely for the uh, progression of quality care in the management of ROP, Dr. Subhadra. Thank you, sir, for that welcome. So I'm just telling that, you know, I used to operate till late in the night. Now my theater doesn't end till 11, 11.30. My hospital is very unhappy. So there are lots of cases waiting for you to do the surgeries. There are a huge number of cases. And they're getting delayed because they have to go to a tertiary center. And this is just the data of 
last you know 15 years to show that there's a tenfold increase in the babies who are coming to us and there's also a tenfold increase in the number of babies who need surgery not only for rop but for many other diseases so i think most retina surgeons should learn pediatric retina surgery because it's nothing different from what you do for other cases so coming to the cases which come to us most of these ROPs are tractional which means you just need to re release the scar tissue and the retina will go back so you don't need to put tamponades and do endolaser some of them have an exudative component more recently we have started recognizing that there can be a regmatogenous component in some of the acute cases of course they can happen later also a large majority of these detachments are bilateral and it will start very early earlier in APROP and then it has various configurations and we have to differentiate it from other detachment causes causing disorders but overwhelmingly our practice is ROP and its detachments. The important thing to remember is that unlike the other tractional detachments of diabetes or Eels disease or uh, you know BRBOs these are very rapidly progressive every day they will increase so your time duration of handling them is very minimal. So if you see a patient who was born with an attached retina and now he comes with a leukocoria detachment, that means we have failed to you know, control this disease. And we could have done surgery on time and repaired that retina before it had led to a macular detachment or a complete leukocoria. We have so many surgical techniques available to us uh, to handle these cases, right from belt buckle to lens sparing vitrectomy to doing vitrectomy from alternate sizes, Simmer has presented so many times, you can operate from nasal side, temporal side, inferior, superior, you can put your cannula in so many different ways, you can do the surgery in one area and once you clear the scar tissue in that area, you can change your cannulas and put a fourth potent two from another side. So lens sparing vitrectomy is really a great technique because the babies get really good outcomes in this. Then of course if the disease is more advanced, you may have to remove the lens. Uh, which rapidly reduces the outcome in terms of the vision and the glaucoma. But yes, still you can salvage a lot of these eyes. Then open sky vitrectomy for very selected cases I have done along with penetrating keratoplasty and more recently doing sclerimbrication surgery learned from Dr. Gopal. If there's a late onset detachment, regmatogenous, in a tractional baby, you can do it. And last but not the least is observation. Don't do anything. It's not necessary that all cases we operate. We can observe certain cases, especially very advanced cases and see are they really advancing or they have reached their uh, pinnacle and now they are not going to worsen. So this is one of the earliest cases which I, this was the first case I did, actually this patient I sent to Dr. Gopal because I was so nervous about operating, I said you go there and they will, he will operate you for belt buckle but the parents went there, he told please get belt buckle done, they came back to me. So this belt buckling currently I use for patients who have a circumferential traction in the periphery but it is still active but there is no anterior posterior traction so there is no persistent fetal vasculature or a stalk which is pulling it towards the lens those cases do well with belt buckle and then there is a question of whether this buckle should be released or not so there is controversy in that I used to release all the buckles now I release only selected buckles the lens sparing with track me again I'm just showing you this case my first one of my initial cases I did the laser it seemed to be doing quite well this was pre anti of era and only nasal side little traction is there so I can observe and you can see after a week the traction seemed to be closing but still macula is attached so I didn't do anything and five days later you can see how the whole thing has just dragged so that gave me a lesson that these detachments progress very fast so even if it is in the nasal side even if it is a small area now I have zero tolerance for any traction. The moment I see traction, it will go ahead and operate and you know it will go back. It just looks like a pristine retina. So there are a lot of tractional forces in these uh, eyes which we need to tackle. They can be anteroposterior, circumferential, ridge to ridge. So you know how the technique is done and what is the battlefield that we go into it. But this is what is timely referral. So here we can see I've learned my lesson that retina was just detaching in the periphery a little bit, just two clock hours. And I went ahead and did a 15 minute surgery lens sparing. And you can see that retina completely healed, completely normal. Uh, you know that baby is going to see really well. So the lens sparing with retina is such a great technique because it takes very short time. The, the, the challenge is the anesthesia to get anesthesia for these babies. Then, uh, you know, Tapas has shown to us, you can have very fulminant disorder, like the bleb shaped, and you can't see the disc, you can't see the macula. Now these patients need a combination therapy. They will not respond to just surgery. You need to give injection, you need to do laser same day, and then within one or two days you can operate and then you can salvage a lot of these eyes, not all the eyes. 
sometimes you should not operate for example this is exudative detachments now exudative detachments again they have not been highly reported we have published a series of cases they respond very well to your injection and laser so they don't really need surgery the first time i saw this case i thought this is endophthalmitis and i actually took a vitreous biopsy and injected antibiotic in one of the eyes but later i realized that this was an exudative detachment which very well responds to your injection and lasers Coming to stage five, our data showed that a lot of these patients come to us with corneal scarring. That means that they were not referred on time, even if they had stage five. They go from one center to other, trying to find a cure, and ultimately they land somewhere where some surgeon is ready to treat them. A lot of them are bilaterally blind. A lot of them are non-paying, but a large majority of these were paying patients. So you know, it's not that you're doing some charity work. The mean age was nine months initially. Now it has come down to four to five months. they could have come earlier and we could have given better outcome to them so this is our 10000 premature baby you can see the leukocoria came to us at 5 months so if you don't operate this stage 5 again it is a progressive disease don't think it stops it leads to more scarring more hypotony secondary glaucoma corneal scarring so month by month it keeps on worsening so it's not going to be static so they need surgery so you know when you are operating these i have just put this to just highlight that these detachments are like a morning glory flower so you approach them from the top and each petal you keep on dissecting till you reach the funnel and then you remove the stalk and the funnel will open that is the basic principle on which this disease is operated upon so you know so will you operate this yeah you we can operate see this looks like a closed funnel look a courier but now the baby is seeing the light and it's you know holding on to the objects the funnel was opened we can see the retina now and these babies will have ambulatory vision so this is about the uh, combined treatment open sky yes if you have early corneal scarring you have two approaches you can either do a lensectomy and wait for 4 to 6 weeks the cornea clears up and then you can carry on your stage 5 rop in a closed technique but if it is more scarred then you can do it along with the graft and there's also a good technique you can take help of your cornea colleague to do open sky vitrectomy and for the scleral imbrication yes it's a quite a simple technique in the sense that you make scleral flaps uh tie them over i like to put a buckle on them you can drain also so this is for those eyes who come back with a regmatogenous detachment where you had already managed or it was a spontaneously regressed tractional detachment uh, psychiatric rop so this is one of those cases this patient i had done uh, lensectomy vitrectomy when he was a baby for stage 4b and he was doing very well playing and then suddenly one day the child comes that he is stop playing and we found a reg rd and you can see it was very difficult to say like you know if i try to do a vitrectomy uh, how am i going to attach it so i did this clear implication technique and the retina was well attached and child is back to school so just an external surgery didn't have to go inside and search all those membranes and put oil and have multiple surgeries done then another case this is actually from dhaka uh, was sent to me with this type of detachment and i was sure that i'll have to remove the lens and you know do a vitrectomy and how i'm going to face it but i just did a imbrication and you can see the fold actually opened up and the whole disease went away we did peripheral laser in this patient so this is another patient uh, very bad looking retina it's so thin if you try to do vitrectomy you're sure to create multiple you know uh, breaks in this eye but scleral imbrication put it back but putting back the retina is not enough this child was sent to a blind school although with telescope training he has 2050 vision and we gave a certificate against the local doctor who said he should go to a blind school this child is now in the premier school which is navodaya vidyalaya so our work continues attach retina give refraction give the vision training give the low vision aids enable these children to go back to their life the post surgery i think one thing people are missing is the anisometropia the refraction immediately after lens sparing with trachme in few months there will be a huge increase in the refraction and there can be an anisometropia or high myopic error so these patients need very close follow up for the refraction and treatment and the outcomes don't examine the outcomes at 2 months 6 months 6 weeks 8 weeks no the outcomes have to be measured after 3 years 4 years 5 years what are they doing what is their activity and we have seen your know, good outcomes children with stage 5 rop they can write letters they can go to normal schools with little help so it's not that everybody will be plpr vision when you give them vision training some of them do good of course it depends on how early they were referred white eyes i don't operate yeah if it is unilateral stage 5 
these eyes will be aphakic unilateral and they will be small eyes squinting eyes so they will not follow your contact lens and patching so this is a relative contraindication but yeah some patients we do operate if there is complete retinal dysplasia like something like this where there is no optic nerve no retina seen uh, these we don't operate if we know that this has severe optic atrophy like post meningitis or post hydrocephalus and you are not even you know having light perception then we may not operate these eyes extensive subretinal echoes on the B scan because that shows there is a lot of cholesterol a lot of blood it may be already a hemophthalmic eye if the child is beyond two two and a half years of age the surgery works advanced surgery works on the principle of the eye expanding and the retina going back uh, or if there's ocular cord calcification then that surgery is not going to function i operated few cases of secondary glaucoma bifthalmos post rop none of not even one of them did well so now i don't do these surgeries so there are certain very advanced cases which we don't operate but you know you are operating advanced cases of trauma of endophthalmitis panophthalmitis you never ask what's going to be the outcome so don't ask for stage 5 stage 4 think of the possibilities think of the pathology think of new instrumentation that we could use to get back that retina these retinas are not ischemic their optic nerves are healthy they have detached after 6 weeks of age so they have good functionality of the optic nerve visual system so if you are able to get that retina back then the really function also comes back thank you uh i would like to thank dr shubhadra for the presentation about retinal detachment management it's not an easy subject and not many people would be interested in performing surgery but if i can ask you just one question dr shubhadra uh if somebody a novice surgeon wants to start doing stage 5 and stage 4 rop surgeries which cases would you recommend them to start with and not uh, start with very difficult cases start which one would you recommend yeah so so there are stage 4a and 4b cases where there is just a central detachment and a small stock in the center these are the best cases to go because you are not at risk of touching anything in the periphery you just go inside cut that stock close to the lens and then do a core vitrectomy uh, that is the ones which i gave to my fellows to start all my fellows are learning lens sparing vitrectomy Uh, and many of them are learning stage five, so there is no reason that fellows in fellowship should not learn how to laser. I'm surprised that they are not even training in lasers, but you know, lasers everybody should train. Surgery also, you are training in macular hole surgery, you are training in PVR surgery. There is no reason for you not to train in ROP surgery, or you know, I mean, don't I don't want to put the pediatric retina surgery on a pedestal. Everybody can do it. Just find your guru, find your teacher, like you find for all other surgeries. and everybody can do people who were never doing i mean dr dogra was not doing for so many years he is doing now i mean i never did i also learned anybody can learn all types of surgeries yeah i think if you if you are given an option to start rop surgery the cases where you will maximally benefit the person is in stage 4 as and bs so there before the retinal detachment is extensive if you just go in clear the traction in the majority of the cases you will do very well and the surgical technique itself is very very simple it's just that you need to know how to manipulate in a small eye with a little exposure without touching the lens and of course the general anesthesia risks are involved so barring that surgical technique wise is pretty pretty simple and stage 5 is a little requires more of patience than i would say skill skill wise you probably require more skill to doing a diabetic bad diabetic trd or advanced pvr but what it requires a lot more patience and diligence so that you don't create retinal breaks while you are operating but you sort of patiently remove all the fibrous tissue there's a lot we can discuss but i guess time doesn't permit let's go to the last presentation which is on issues which is just a potpourri of subjects which uh, i sort of put together no they don't go in a correct sequence but i thought they may be important in the overall perspective of rop management can we can one miss identifying rop i can assure you because even i missed so in experience examiner of course more easy to miss not that experience examiners cannot miss a rushed examination maybe because you are seeing too many patients in a given day or you are rushed to go from a place to place <coughs> or less than optimum conditions for examination like a brightly lit nicu is not the best place to examine for rop so you should have the guts to tell the nurse to switch off the lights at least in the area where you are examining the baby and improperly positioned crib so you try to maneuver yourself between the two cribs and try to examine the baby 
rather than trying to push the baby to a, a particular location where you are comfortably examining. There are tubes all around the infant. It doesn't matter. You should tend to ignore all the intricacies, the tubes around the baby, but try to examine uh, very carefully the eyeball. A very unstable infant where there is a pressure by the neonatologist that your examination should be very brief. Obviously, you would like to have the most experienced examiner examining, and that's it. Not allow the the, uh, the trainee examiners to examine this particular baby. Inadequately dilating pupils is a challenge. Then, of course, you can slightly indent people dilate a little bit. Use a 30 day after lens. You can still manage to get some uh, idea as to what is happening. And sometimes a red cam can actually be more useful in a relatively non dilating pupil compared to indirect ophthalmoscopy under these uh, difficult situations. But of course, in those cases, you re examine the baby after day or two and not after next week by using some steroid drops so the pupil will dilate better. The safeguard against missing ROP is final examination clearance is given always by an experienced examiner. If the first examination is done by a trainee resident, then once you clear the case as having no ROP only by an experienced examiner and not by just a teleconsultation alone. It is always done with indirect ophthalmoscopy with indentation before you clear it as no ROP. Okay, so dilatation for ROPI examination. Studies have shown that the significant blood levels of cyclopentrolate uh, in the blood can be associated with gastric residuals, and that can have create problems for neonatologists in terms of aspiration, etc. So there are alternative dilation methods which are not as yet available, but perhaps something which we can keep in mind or even promote this idea with the uh, pharmacy or with the, with the industry to allow us to have specific products for ROP dilation such as media set, lower conjunctival phonics packing, micro drops where the amount of medicine you put in the eye is minimized. So the systemic absorption and toxic effects are correspondingly reduced. And a diligence with punctal occlusion because very often you order dilation, the neonatal nurse will put the drops. She's not bothered about using punctal occlusion and all that. She just puts the drops and then calls you after half an hour. So that is where probably there's importance for us to train the neonatal nurse that there is importance in occluding the puncta. There is also the problem of internal observer variation in interpretation. Just to uh, highlight the problem, the study by Campbell in 2016 of 1,553 eyes, comparing PIO with red cam image evaluation showed there is a 40% disagreement in the staging classification, 18% disagreement in the plus disease classification, and 8% disagreement in the zonal distribution, which is zone 2 or zone 1. So 40% disagreement in the overall staging. So this is a huge amount of discrepancy between two observers in terms of what it is. So this is even more relevant when talking of tele-interpretation of the images, wherein this problem can be very, very important. Likewise, in a study from by Fleck et al., they have shown as part of a boost trial that the treatment requiring ROP was more often diagnosed by the British ophthalmologists versus New Zealand, the same pictures seen by the two groups. And plus disease again was more often diagnosed by the British ophthalmologists compared to New Zealand. So this tells you that there can be difference of opinion when you're interpreting the same eye or examining the same eye even with the BIO. This particular uh, chart gives you some guidelines as to labeling what is zone one versus zone two. Because zone one versus zone two, not just talking in terms of clock hours, or the, from the macula, but in terms of characteristics which can define zone 1 ROP. This is, in zone 1, the disease obviously is in the posterior pole. In zone 2, it's outside the posterior pole, that we know. But how do we know in a given eye, is it restricted to the posterior pole or not? We are not going to sit there and measure, uh, draw circles on the eye. So, zone 1 ROP is always 360 degrees, that is 12 clock hours. While zone 2 can be variable. Normal arcades are almost absent in zone 1 ROP versus zone 2 ROP. A ridge is present in zone 2 but very often is absent in zone 1 ROP where you find dilated vessels within between no capillary seen. A wedge is never present in zone 1 ROP while in zone 2 you can have a wedge at the temporal uh, horizontal meridian. Regression probably doesn't occur spontaneously in zone 1 
but with treatment it can, while in zone 2 spontaneous regression can happen. So there's a poor overall unfavorable outcome in zone 1 versus zone 2. So comparing, considering all the factors together, one, we can, one can define what is zone 1 versus zone 2 and then indicate the indication for uh, anti-VEGF treatment. There's also the plus disease conundrum, ICROP 3, third edition, in which Dr. Uh, uh, Vinayakar was a part of this team, have defined that the plus disease is a continuous spectrum. And, but they left it at that. But the definition of still type 1 and type 2 ROP is based upon labeling it as plus or no plus, not as a part of the continuous spectrum. So you are still left with defining it as is there plus or not so that I can treat the patient. If there's no plus, you probably can observe. There's also no guideline as to what to do if you label it as pre-plus. Would you treat or would you not treat? So these are situations where you have to use your own uh, intuitive uh, indication as to treat or observe. So the practical suggestions are if pre-plus is diagnosed and the diagnosis of plus is still doubtful, perhaps it's best to have one more opinion from your colleague and tilt towards the plus if the fellow eye has a frank plus, tilt, treat it as a plus if the child is likely to go for any surgical intervention for systemic indications as I just now indicated and shorten the interval between examinations to facilitate better conclusions. The APROP, the confusion of the diagnosis, because the APROP is characterized by flat neovascularization. This can be zone one, but it can also be posterior zone two. It need not be only a zone one disease. So peripheral or mid-peripheral APROP also has been described now. It is characterized by severe plus disease, large vascular loops, and retinal vascular and vitreous hemorrhages, which is a characteristic. Usually affects extremely premature babies, but often more sick babies and also with unmonitored oxygen treatment. There are hybrid varieties described. Dr. Mangatram Dr. was first to describe these hybrid diseases. Varieties have components of both the degree of classic component versus the APROP component. The hybrid varieties obviously have better prognosis because parts of the retina is behaving like a classic ROP. They are described in heavier babies and have been described with zone two. Extreme forms pose no difficulty in diagnosis, but this is a, a publication from the LSHTM course on ROP, which tends to give you two pictures which can be similar, but different. One was AP ROP, another is a classical ROP stage three plus. You can see the typical uh, ridge in the temporal periphery in the picture to your, uh, uh, to your right. So that tells you that it's a classic ROP and not an AP ROP. So treating 6 o'clock and 12 o'clock meridians with laser could be very tricky and very often people have missed treating that area and what's the cause for a recurrence in that area. So it's easy to miss this area unless you continuously go from one meridian to the next meridian and not jump uh, from one area to another area. So ideal is to position yourself diametrically opposite the meridian you're treating. If it's 12 o'clock, it is 6 o'clock you stand. If it's 6 o'clock, it's 12 o'clock you stand. You can rotate the baby around so that you don't have to move, but the baby keeps rotating, and then you treat. In a non-dilating people, you can use a 30 diopter, diopter lens and produce at least some burns posteriorly, very close to the ridge, so that you get a better chance to treat once the people start dilating, as you've already treated some areas. And treat posteriorly as much as possible, because that is the area which liberates maximum VEGF. The area of avascular retina very close to the ridge is what secretes maximum VEGF. So you treat there. In the worst case, you can always treat with tropical steroid or anti-VEGF and then treat subsequently. Follow up post-injection of anti-VEGF. How frequently does one follow up these children? If no recurrence, but there's persistent evascularization, what to do? When do we decide on laser to evascularize? Some of these have been already answered. I'm sure uh, you have a lot of questions about this, but I don't think time permits us to discuss about each one of them in detail. Now, is there any role of buckle in stage four and five ROP? In stage five ROP, perhaps there's really no role, except if it's mostly exudative RD with a little bit of peripheral fibrosis, then you can still try band and a drainage. I have done in one case uh, where I just put a band and a drainage and actually did extremely well. It was stage five in the sense it's a total RD and macula is involved, but in the sense that the entire RD is not fibrotic and tractional. 
part of it is actually exudative and periphery is actually having fibro disease and hence it worked well with a just a buckle no vitrectomy does one operate on eyes with fully formed false form fold with retinal retinal sinica i would think as long as the, if the retina is stuck from the anterior to all the way to the rpe there's no way you can really open it there's no meaning in operating on such eyes especially these eyes coming after one year of age there's no meaning in operating but if it's like a tent there's still a possibility that if you can relieve traction you can reduce at least the amount of retina that is caught up in the retinal retinal sinica and give them little better vision if a break forms during vitreoretinal surgery for rop is there a role of tamponading yes and no if you create a break in an eye where there is you only relieved about 30% of traction there's really not much you can do about it perhaps it's best you close the eye and go home rather than prolonging the anesthesia for no reason but if you relieved most of the traction and you created a break sometimes you can get away with removing all traction and even putting a tamponading agent i've had good success with siliconal tamponading agent only in stage 4b eyes wherein periphery has been well treated and is fibrotic and while dissecting it created a break then you remove the entire traction put in silicon oil they do quite well but full blown stage 5 ROPs with tractional lardi with a closed funnel configuration you very often don't do well with any tamponading agent thank you very interesting attention so if there are any questions if they allow us to discuss we can discuss here otherwise we can discuss over a cup of coffee outside do you allow us to discuss here i think there's no other session here right there's no other session here so you are free to ask questions actually a uh, few weeks back i was attending uh, one webinar on the medico legal aspects in rop cases so the one uh, uh, issue was that the role of bevacizumab if if we are using bevacizumab then then how legally we are safe or or uh, is there any you can say uh, work our society is doing uh, with the help of dci to get the approval uh, for the avastin in rop so as a matter of fact <clears throat> i wanted to uh, throw some light on that Bevacizumab is off label but not illegal. Uh, the society is working with the National Law School in Bangalore. We were supposed to have a workshop actually three weeks ago, but got postponed because of this. We are coming out hopefully with a legal paper. Uh, it's very strong in favor of Bevacizumab. Let me summarize what work has already gone on with the legal experts. Reason is uh, there was, as you will know, a ban on uh, Avastin in 2017-2018. Uh, for adult use because of the spate of infections that happened in two states and then subsequently the leadership in VRSA and AIOS uh, argued with the DGCI and uh, reversed that ban but the lawyers feel that a reversal of ban is is a very strong point in favor of the drug also two judgments one from uh, France and one from Britain uh, at the supreme court level in their and legislation have in fact the nhs says that you must use bevacizumab before you prefer ranibizumab because it saves the nhs millions of pounds uh, and this is not just narop in adults as well so that is one point and the french government has also legitimized bevacizumab to be used in both uh, adult and pediatric so i think we have some very strong points going for us uh, the idea is to create a white paper uh, from uh, the society and uh, with the legal experts and then submit it to government of india yeah additionally i think that you know most of the legal cases you are able to show that in a similar situations with, with would your other peers do the same thing that's a very strong defense if you show that you know the asrs survey or any other surveys ap vrs survey on use of various antivirals year after year it is showing that majority of people even in countries where things are legally approved they are using vasmap for various disorder so if you are in a case and then you can bring an expert me him anybody would you use avastin in babies we will all say yes you know so there is uh, if your peers are using if everybody else is using if there are millions of publications on that drug you see the the randomized control trials they are using it so you have evidence that it is being used used safely and that you used it because everybody else is using you know and of course the white paper will help but there's you know, now an saying, on label comes, you, uh, on you label bevacizumab yeah. in the us now which is just being tested for adults of course and that is going to create a problem in the united states because if that is approved then off label bevacizumab will not be allowed at least in the us and that is expected to be something like 700 dollars as against 70 dollars of uh, avastin and that's going to create a big problem uh, but hopefully we are not going to see that problem here 
that might raise the price That's itself true. and uh, it will become like other any other drug but uh, i think the important message is very good consent if you have taken that and you don't uh, uh, go beyond that that will be very important and uh, once you have taken that for because off label even we are giving intravitreal antibiotics these are off label drugs they are not we no even uh, vancomycin ceftriazidine they are being treated uh, for i mean so many uh, they are all uh, they are not meant for uh, ringer lactate uh, ringer lactate is not approved for i only bss is approved are you not using ringer lactate all of us are using right yeah i have a question to anybody on the panel basically uh, many times when we are following a babies uh, who are having mild rop or who are not having rop we are immature and they are given blood transfusion for correction of anemia you see a lot of angry vessels and sometimes you see these intraretinal hemorrhages and there is suddenly an upstaging of disease so what is your take on that and how do you like do you wait for a couple of weeks for that to pass away or do you treat it as a real upstaging and treat it i mean what do you do in such case very rightly observed so when it, a baby is imminently required for treatment then uh, and we find low hb and they need to transfuse we see if uh, we can either defer the treatment by 48 hours or they can defer the transfusion by 48 hours if they have already transfused and you have to go laser as you said firstly uh, there is a transient increase in tortuosity often misdiagnosed as a more severe form of plus or while you're treating itself you might cause more hemorrhages so but if the transfusion is going to save the life and that's more important go ahead and do it you have to discuss case by case and you can defer the treatment by about 48 hours not maybe more than that and often the transient plus will reduce after that period uh, if that is not required as a life saving thing and they depend on you to give an opinion whether transfusion should be done then you would depend on whether this baby requires treatment in the next 48 hours or not so if it is reached uh, classical type 1 rop and you are any way would have treated it with or without the anemia then treat it and then they can transfuse later thank you yes true sir we agree another question if possible it's my request from dr parijat to describe the technique for that injection that you should we should go half just half needle 1 to 1.5 and then yes dr parijat that's a very important thing i actually wanted to ask that question but because of time we couldn't discuss that so how do you safely give an intravitreal uh, anti vgf in a small baby so uh, when i said we given the ot so we have the magnification and the sterility which is there uh, so i like to give it in 1.5 to 2 mm again it's very small baby again it depend on the age but usually in that age group we try to give it in 1.5 and 2 we have to give it under 2 and uh, we don't inject we inject with 30 gauge needle and we inject one injection plus per uh, eye and uh, obviously we don't inject the whole needle in once it gives way and uh, the technique i just do it like you inject a trocar cannula for a surgery so i put it on the Uh, maybe so on the video also we put it on the conjunctiva and it displays the conjunctiva so before that i mark with the indent so that the indent is there on the sclera if you do with the gv or something it might displays to some other place so we indent with the uh, caliper at that distance so that a dent forms on the sclera so even if you displays the conjunctiva the dent does not go away then you displays it so that there's one opening of conjunctiva then you displays then you go inside in a lamellar fashion then you go um, uh, towards the middle of the vitreous the idea again is not to inject the whole insert the whole needle just as soon as it gives and goes a little inside you uh, the assistant injects it so uh, many people like to inject it on their own but uh, if you just see the two hands one in, one hand you are holding the limbs to fixate the eye and the other hand you are injecting uh, inside and the assistant injects if you try to do both you know then the eye starts moving and shaking and then it's a problem and then obviously you uh, uh, put a swab stick or something and then you take it out and the assistant holds the uh, thing so with the limbs you're holding the uh, eye you're still holding the eye the this thing uh, needle you're withdrawing the assistant puts the swab stick he takes the uh, syringe and you hold the swab stick yes yes in selected yes. case it is important yes sir. i think there are two yeah. 
it doesn't select it cases it does do miracles yeah i'll just add to like how i inject little different yeah. so this is the eye of the baby i take a q tip okay i take the johnson bud or whatever it is and i put it on the cornea and now the globe is stabilized i take the needle like this i hold it like this so that i'm completely in control i usually inject at 9 o'clock so if it's the right eye it will be here if it's the left eye it will be nasal if it's the right eye it will be temporal so same same point this every is, time this is swab stick this is swab stick just hold it like that on the cornea so baby cannot move their eyes of course the sister is holding the baby's head and all but the eye i am holding with this hand and i'm holding the syringe like this and i just go like this i don't put any mark i know okay it's 1 mm i just go like this inject and then i turn this swab stick and close that and then i remove So, uh, so the advantage of that is that you know I I use the three and nine o'clock because that is the maximum palpable fissure where it's open and always the globe I keep vertical because then there's no way that I will touch the lens and the baby cannot move. So go like this, inject, and then turn this around and this remove. So then I move the conjunctiva. It's almost always closed. You know it will not leak and it will not you will not need to. you know move the conjunct type again because this is 30 gauge needle it's not 23 24 where you need to move like the conjunct type what But i have what i is most important yeah, yeah. what i have observed ma'am uh, some of the kids move their eye inferiorly some of the kids move upwards that's why so, that's why it's yeah. not moving the eye yeah. will not move because you are holding the yes, globe yes, completely yes, like yes. that it will not move it will not i think as an extension of this let me also share with one one some situations where it may not be always that easy in the sense where the eyeball is rather deep set and you cannot really spread the lids apart enough to give you space for a convenient comfortable passage of the needle where you are afraid the needle will actually rub the eyelashes and go we don't want to touch the eyelashes when you're going in after you're gone in if it touches the eyelashes it's still okay but as you're going in you cannot touch anything so sometimes you are forced to turn the eyeball a little up so that you have sufficient space to go in that's where the technique which dr parjad was telling of two people doing injection yeah. not one person you hold the eyelid eyeball up and go in and just hold it the second person will press the plunger you don't touch the plunger so that way you don't have any risk of touching the lens when you try to release this and you hold this the eyeball will again turn back and then the needle can actually go up and touch the lens so we don't want that so just two things i want to add i usually carry this to show this is the 32 gauge needle uh it's not available right now but you can get it imported it's a japanese company i'm happy to share uh and we use this now routinely it's 4 mm you can go down to the hub that fear of going halfway and touching the lens are gone in addition like dr parijat said i usually use the flint depressor the same thing that we use for uh the laser and i depress the upper nasal quadrant and therefore that exposes the lower temporal quadrant and i usually inject there uh and again i use another assistant to actually uh, press the plunger even though with this needle uh, you can go really down into the hub still i would not dare actually lift, leave off my left hand so i am just controlling the movement and the plunge i insert and then somebody else presses it and then once i remove this there's a q tip ready to hold it i hold it for about 30 seconds then the usual beat it in um for those of you all who want to see the read the rest of the protocol it's called safer safer protocol it's by amy hartnet um it's a group that uh, propagated the smaller gauge needle so the s stands for smaller gauge uh this can be uh, you can ship it it's actually very uh, inexpensive one syringe one needle comes to about 50 to 60 rupees when you can buy it in bulk of 100 basically the the same thing we are doing that we are uh, fixing the eye uh, in the opposite quadrant either with the depressor or 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 with the bird yes you you wanted to share some of your right premlata had a question i think i have got a baby which uh, pediatrician had told that uh, she, she needs uh, blood transfusion and it is in stage 3 plus uh, so how you procedure proceed for such cases i think this was already answered either you go ahead and do the laser and then send for transfusion but if it's very anemic like 5 6 hemoglobin then obviously you have to do the transfusion and then you can do the laser in 24 hours sometimes if you think that it needs an injection you can go ahead and inject many times the pediatrician may not clear for laser he'll say you have got four 
before we do uh, yeah, uh, blood transfusion they will not clear for laser so it's not an option basically yeah. they won't take it without yeah if it's four five so. patient can go into apnea while you are doing the laser injection you can still do but then injection will not work for long if you have not corrected the anemia but if it's eight nine okay one can go also would matter what is the birth weight what is the feeding of the baby so the overall health it's not just the anemia uh, my question nowadays quite a number of term babies are sent for the rop screening as a medical legal this thing how much examination we should do we should do the scleral depression till that so when big babies are sent they are sent for two three reasons one is that they were on oxygen okay a lot of them will not get rop but we have published data on even big babies getting rop because of the inadequate oxygen practices the second thing is some of these big babies they were not doing well they actually have torch infection or some other lesions they also can have like a cherry red spot or some other um, things including fevr in children who are not growing well so i think when they come to you you should definitely do a complete examination including the optic nerve some of these children later will develop delayed visual maturation or cerebral visual impairment because they had fits so they were on oxygen or they had hypoglycemia so i think if somebody is sending it's good to do a proper retinal examination until this uh, or depression and ora serrata yeah you see up to ora serrata but usually you can see a good ilm reflex you can see that you know vessels are branching even I if know. you can't see that last bit of ora it's okay Uh, you know they don't have anything else but look what i'm trying to say is look for everything else no that we know. yeah okay. i think we may have to stop after some time yeah go, go ahead with your questions <laughs> good evening everyone uh, sir mentioned about uh, injecting in both eyes simultaneously there are uh, institutes which do not practice that and there are some who do that so is there any guideline or the panels intake on whether we should be going ahead with both eye injection in the same sitting or uh, legally why, we why are why do you want okay. to wait both eyes are getting bad so if you are, are you if you are at risk of infection if your infection rate in the institute is high then please don't inject both eyes together if your infection rates are low your sep a sepsis is good then you can inject both eyes so it all depends on how the practice is okay like you don't want to land up in bilateral endophthalmitis that is the main reason why we don't do both eyes cataract surgery on one day exactly, or yeah. you know so any or both eyes injection in adult patients but if your practices are good and you have good backup to manage that endophthalmitis in small babies it's very difficult to manage an endophthalmitis if it occurs right so that is the reason why many institutes don't want to do it now if you are really pressed for time you can inject in the morning one eye and you do the injection for the other eye in the evening okay. at least you have a 10 hours gap in the two eyes but make sure that you are using different trays different material the scrubbing is good then you are okay one of the major reasons why data is published uh, about you know bilateral surgeries i we are just going to publish our data on bilateral simultaneous injections so once some data is published then you have at least little some more legal uh, ethical evidence mm. that this can be done the other risk sometimes people have is that are you injecting too much drug into the system mm. okay but that is not a valid reason because as parijat said when both eyes are doing bad you don't want to leave one eye okay not with mm. treatment mm. but what we published that you can see that publication we injected one eye on day 1 and we did laser peripheral in the other eye because anyway we knew that this is okay. aprop it will need laser later mm -hmm. and then after 3 days we injected the one eye and then we did the laser in the other eye. so that's also a possibility one of the major reasons actually why people inject both eyes is because you're mostly using a half dose and if you buy a vial of ranibizumab which is expensive you don't want to waste the other half so okay. you give it but you have to ensure that you aseptic controls are very good from a legal perspective sorry from a legal perspective the irop society published the survey of all the users 89% preferred bilateral on the same day uh, but you have to take a special consent because vrsi consent for anti vegf is one eye only of course that's for adults so you must add that sentence and explain to the parents that it is going to be bilateral uh, that would be required so the only added factor i would like discuss is only for discussion not that you cannot give same time is that if the disease is asymmetric in the two eyes and still there is a borderline indication in both eyes you can always inject in the more severe eye first and there is a chance there is a chance that because systemic absorption does take place 
the fellow eye also can start regressing and you may not actually need the injection in the other eye. You can always reevaluate in a, just about 48 hours later or 72 hours later and then take a call. But injecting same time yes, is a risk. At the same time, it's of benefit. So there are always uh, pluses and minuses. You have to decide it yourself. Thank, Thank you. you.